All right, so let's take a look at a more complex circuit and try to analyze a circuit to make sure we know what's going on. Now, this is a fairly sizable circuit, so let's see what happens here. We're going to use something called the mesh. I like using mesh because I am a very simple type of troubleshooter. And what we're going to do with the mesh is just write a loop. There's one loop, two loops, and three loops. So we've got three loops. So the very first rule is make loops clockwise. So we did our three loops clockwise. Step two, we're going to add all of our points of friction that are on each loop and add them up. Step three, subtract any points of friction. Step four, set it equal to and then the value of voltage that it is going into. And then we're going to set the three equations, in this particular case, equations, and solve for the loops. All right, so we're going to go and do this right now. Let's look at loop number one. Loop one, I'm going to start and go clockwise. So I've got 1K plus 3K plus 2K means I have 4, 5, 6, 6 IAs. So I have 1K plus 3K for 4. 4 plus 2 is 6K IAs. We're going to call this loop A. And then I'm going to subtract any point of friction that I have. And the only point of friction that I have is right there at that 3. So I'm going to subtract 3K I, and we're going to call this, say, a loop B. Again, don't get confused. Now, is there any friction caused by this red loop on the far right-hand side? And the answer is no. So we'll put 0I, and we'll call that C. And then we're going to set this equal to whatever value of voltage that it comes into, and it's coming into a minus 20. And so that's what we would write for our first loop. And then the second loop that we're going to do is this middle loop, the blue loop. Add up to, that's a 4, so that's 6 plus 1 for 7 plus another 3 for 10. So that means, and I'm going to do this in a particular order, that's going to be a positive 10KIB. So that means the blue loop has any Ks that are in that loop will be additive. Anything that's in friction, we will subtract. So the only friction point that is in this particular case is that 3K right there. So I subtract 3KIA. Now why did I write it kind of different? Well, the reason I did it is I want to have my A's this way my B's this way, and my C's in this column right here, so everything stacks up nicely. Now, the friction point, is there a friction point on this guy right here? Oh, there is. There's a friction of minus 4K IC right there. And then we set it equal to whatever voltage it comes in. So if I started here and then worked my way around, there's no voltage in this middle loop, so that becomes zero. And then let's do this last one. Anywhere where there's points where they add up, that would be 3, 4, and 2K, so that's 9K, so that's a plus 9K IC. How about any friction points? Well, there's only one friction point, and that friction point would be caused by the blue guy, so that would be minus 4K IB. And then finally, is there any IA friction point? There is not, so we get rid of that, and then we set it equal to when we go into a clockwise manner, whatever it's coming into, so this time it's coming into a positive 12. And that is our equation. So the mesh analysis is a much easier analysis to do because it just looks at a complete loop. We set it equal to whatever value it comes into for the power source. If there is no power source, like the middle loop, we just set it equal to zero. And then we're gonna take these three equations and we're going to put them into a solver. All right, so here's the thing. We're going to hit this into a solver. I'm going to hit pause, bring up the solver, and solve it next. Set up our mesh equation. I went to the internet and I put in a equation solver, a three by three, because these are three equations with three unknowns. And there's a really good website out there, math.pd.pennstateuniversity.edu. And from the Department of Physics, and you can see in the bottom left-hand side, this is their website. And so what we have here is a very nice, simple way to solve for this equation.
Now I just superimposed our three equations with the three unknowns right here. And now we're going to enter them in and solve for the currents that each mesh loop has. Okay, so I'm going to close the ink layer, so we're going to remember all of that stuff. And then we're going to bring it up and put them into here. So just give it a second. This is going to go away, and now we're going to enter it in. So just so you remember, remember that first one was 6K. The second one was a minus 3K. The IC loop, there was no IC loop. And then we set that equal to a minus 20. And then we said for that second, it was minus 3K. It was plus 10K. It was a minus 4K for right there, and it went into a loop with zero. And that last one was there was nothing in the first one. It was minus 4K and 9K. And finally, the last guy was it went into a positive 12. We're going to hit solve, and it's going to give me these three values. The current of IA is going to be equal to a negative 0.00368. So that is going to be 3.68 milliamps. Current from the B loop is going to be equal to a negative 0 0.000694 or 0.694 of a milliamp. Or, if you don't like that, 694 microamps. All right. IC is going to be equal to 0 0.00102, and that would be 1.02 milliamps. So 1.02 milliamps, and there's my three. So just remember these numbers here. We're going to re-put that into our equation in just a minute. So we imported the three answers from the Penn State's 3x3 uh, three three solver for IA, IB, and IC in the upper left-hand side. I took that multiplier, and then I fed it into and multiplied it by 1K ohm. I multiplied it by 3k ohms, and I multiplied that current by 2k ohms to get those three values. Then I did the same with the IB, and I fed that. I multiplied that current by that resistance to get the voltages for those three. And then when I got to the last part, IC, I took that answer and fed it into here. And then those will be the answers. Anywhere I have friction of the minuses and pluses, they will either add or subtract out for the total of the circuit. So this is showing me how to take a complex circuit and use a mesh equation to solve for it. What I want you to look at when we look at a complex circuit here is that we should equal zero volts. They should always add up to being a zero volt. So if I were to take this last guy here and just look at that, I better have three values of voltages. This voltage plus this two values plus that value equals 12. And I just ran my calculations, so if I did this right, we're really darn close. I take 2.776 plus 4.08 to get 6.85 right there. So that's 6.856. If I add 2.04 volts to it, which is this guy, and I add 3.06 to it, that gives me a total of 11.956. I've got a little bit of rounding issue because of all the significant figures here, but that does equal 12 volts. So I could do that for these other two loops, and I would be able to answer that the net voltages across each one of these resistors equals zero. So that's the point that we're trying to make. I take a complex circuit, I do a mesh. I look at one mesh, I look at IB mesh, I look at IC mesh, I plug that into a 3x3 three three solver, I come up with my currents right here and here, feed those currents in, oh this looks great, it's all getting complex, and then I get my answers for my voltages and the nets should equal zero. All right, so we've looked at the three ways we can solve for a circuit right now. We have done a branch method, a node method, and now a mesh. And this is how we look at complex circuits. In our day-to-day -day world, let's be honest with you, we are not going to do these types of analysis when it comes time to troubleshoot a circuit. What it's going to boil down is that we're going to use this to evaluate a more complex circuit. Let's say you've got a voltage charger that is running in a solar system, an off-grid system. So you've got a 20-volt system coming in from your PV modules on your roof, and you're basically backfeeding the current into that circuit. That's, in essence, what's going on here. I am pushing current into that 12-volt system. 
And so we need to be able to recognize that current is going to flow from the high potential of, say, the PV module, back feed through the instruments and the current flow within that circuit board to get that battery and maintain that charge. Once that 12 volts reaches its peak voltage, then we'll get to the float, and these values will dynamically change to keep it at that 13.4 to 13.8 volts that it's required to run. That's really why we do these things, is to be able to look at the background of the story to get a better idea of how it's working.